I welcome everybody to this start of the A series. Um, it's a pleasure to, uh, to meet friends and to have friends as mentors, to have friends as colleagues, and to have friends that we can bounce off every, everything to each other without actually feeling that we actually don't know. Saying that we don't know is the modus that how ACE members, we have been communicating with each other. Um, and we have started this A series and it's none, and we have got Viral. Viral is a very, very close friend of mine. I was introduced to Viral, I think two years ago uh, in a meeting. And since then, Viral has been the pillar of support for ACE. With his help, we've had a collaboration with Clinical Diabetology, where he's the editor-in-chief. It's an excellent journal that's published that contains uh, all the recent things happening. And it's still, you know, it buffers out what shouldn't come in a journal. So actually what a journal should be, it's a landmark uh, journal. And I would presume people to actually subscribe to the journal as well. Now, Viril has been instrumental for us in a lot of things. And he's an excellent speaker. I think... We are having this series uh, in which it's a no bar speaking, non-sponsored by pharma. So no hands are tied, no feet are tied. Uh, you know, the truth comes out. And I think we started with Viral to talk about the latest, you know, hot cake that is there. We talk all about CGMS and everybody is talking about time in range. Uh, whether it actually makes sense in India, whether a consensus actually makes sense in India. And every new CGMS device will come and tell you about their mark. Um, Viral will tell us, he's an expert on that. He will tell us how it's manipulated, how it can be manipulated, how reliable MARD is, what is MARD. Uh, you know, MARD sounds like Amitabh Bachchan in a movie, but it may not be the case. It's, it's, it's quite different uh, what MARD is. So I think uh, we'll let Viral tell us. And I'm sure because we've got at least three, four devices which are knocking to get approved by the end of this year in CGMS. So we're going to get inundated by CGMSs by next year. So we actually have an insight as to what is right, what is not. Viral has now just moved to Indiana. He's a professor of endocrinology and metabolism in Indiana University. Um, and I'll not let you come in the way of uh, Viral. We'll let Viral do the, you know, teach us. We're going to put our videos and audios off while Viral is speaking. And then, and then we'll all reconvene and ask questions. Over to you, Viral. Um. Thank you so much, Mithun, for this flattering introduction. Uh, now, I appreciate that friendship and connection with ACE. And I think uh, the clinical diabetology as a um, uh, the editor of uh, editor in chief for the journal, I think we appreciate that partnership with the ACE uh, organization. And we hope that uh, the consensus, the guidance, the Indian evidence will uh, published in clinical diabetology. So I think I would look forward to that kind of a continuation in our partnership. Um, and uh, again, thanks for inviting me to talk about this uh, two of those uh, CGM related metrics. Um, and uh, as I always speak, uh, even though if it's funded by pharma, I don't really care. Um, I, I just pick what I think is the right. Um, and so I will share my opinion um, around this timing range in MARD. So let me share my slides. Uh, okay, and once you see this in a, presented, or a presentation view, just let me know, Mithun. Um, does this look okay to your screen? It's fine. Okay, perfect. Okay, let me minimize my screen here. All right, so uh, today's talk, I will be focusing on uh, two things, uh, the timing range and MARD. Um, and I think Mithun uh, mentioned to me that I think uh, a lot of CGM companies are coming to India, which is a good thing. I think CGM is a standard of care. Uh, I am pro CGM, so I think that's a good thing happening. But when a lot of companies come to market, uh, we as a physician also needs to be careful about the marketing piece of those things because we don't want the marketing uh, to to kind of like you know make us uh, bias towards uh, something that may not be right in a science. So I will try my best to provide you um, some of the intricacies, uh, issues with this timing range and MARD. 
let me see if I can advance my slide. There we go. Um, I do receive a lot of uh, uh, honoraria consulting fees, um, research support from different uh, industries, um, but not really relevant to today's presentation. So briefly, I think uh, the audience here definitely knows about this part. So probably are not unfamiliar with this concept. So I will not take much time in explaining the concept of time in range. Uh, we all know that A1C is an excellent biomarker for diabetes complication, and it has been proven in the DCCT in type 1 diabetes and UKPDS in type 2 diabetes. So there is no doubt that the A1C is going to stay with us. Uh, this CGM-based matrix, including time in range, is not going to take the A1C away from uh, that kind of equation. And I think uh, currently the FDA, US FDA, which is a regulatory agency, do not uh, consider time in range as uh, outcome for approval of drug or devices. So A1C has its own place um, and it's going to stay, but it has a limitation in a clinical situation. Uh, it's hard to really manage any individual with either type one or type two diabetes just based on, A1, but based on A1C because a lot of issues with A1C. We all know that part. I'm not going to go into the details of those things, but uh, I, I I always give uh, my opinion when I talk about is that um, I don't really care about A1C anymore in my clinical practice. Um, every single patient uh, that I see with type 1 or type 2 diabetes um, on CGM, and CGM really helps us to uh, optimize their diabetes care and management than A1C. So, um, Again, A1C is a good research. It's good biomarker for complication, but it's uh, it has its own limitation in a clinical setting. And so that's why the CGM-based markers or CGM-based matrix has become popular. It has become standard of care, actually, in managing type 1 and type 2 diabetes, particularly those with the insulin treated. It is in a standard of care by American Diabetes Association in 2023-2024 guidance. So um, it's, it's part of now diabetes management. And there has been a um, lot of consensus development, uh, the guidance around how to use CGM, what kind of a matrix that we should be using in a clinical practice, what should be goal of those matrix for people with type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Um, and that field has been evolving over time. So uh, it, just to give you an, a background, um, you know, the first consensus was happened in 2012 um, and you will see a QR code here. Um, and I try to put those QR codes in my presentation so you can just take your camera, scan that QR code, and you can get to that paper uh, if you are interested in reading that uh, paper. I would highly recommend reading this paper because this was the first uh, consensus uh, that was developed around the CGM matrix. Uh, and remember, 2012, at the time in the United States, actually, we didn't have a great uh, CGMs and pumps. There were a few, but uh, not uh, like the the good CGMs that are available in the market. Um, so this was a really good attempt um, forcing that the CGM is going to become a standard of care. So I, I appreciate the vision of those leaders that made this consensus meeting. It was happening in Tampa, Florida. Um, and I think there were 60 plus uh, endocrinologists and experts in the field of diabetes conveyed this meeting. It was two day marathon meeting. Um, where people presented different research and then voted for different metrics and reasons for those things and like that. So timing range, how they voted for timing range. Uh, so of course, there were a lot of proposals about timing range of 70 to 180 and 70 to 140. And there were speakers who spoke about pros and cons of those different timing range uh, but overall, I think uh, the 56% of those experts decided to keep 70 to 180 as a time in range for various reasons. And the reasons were that 70 was considered a threshold for hypoglycemia, and the hypoglycemia threshold was decided based on the FDA guidance that came to the industry for development of artificial, artificial pancreas in 2012. So they wanted to align that with the FDA but then the FDA cited another reference from the previous uh, ADA uh, consensus on defining hypoglycemia, where they say that uh, the counter-regulatory hormones goes up 
uh, during the insulin clamp when the glucose level goes below 70. And that's how I think this number of 70 somehow became a threshold for hypoglycemia, which is still debatable. Um, so, uh, but just to give you that, they said, okay, 70. And then 180 was defined based on a desirable goal for a postprandial glucose in insulin-treated people with diabetes. Now, during that 2012 ADA standard of care, uh, the goal for a postprandial glucose was less than 180. So that's how the 180 became kind of an upper threshold for hyperglycemia. And also the, the discussion was more geared towards that, that we do not have any effective therapy to really have people keep between 70 to 140. So it's very practical to keep 70 to 180 as a time in range at this moment, um, at the time, 2012. Remember that it's a 12 years back. Uh, which got published in 2013, but that consensus was developed in 2012. And now you can also see the definition of hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia were very different than what we are using now, because again, as I said, that this field is evolving. We are making a change um, based on newer evidence, new studies that comes out in this field. Um, so, and then again, I think next couple of uh, years that you will see that it will rapidly change. And then 2023, um, uh, this consensus was published in a journal, Diabetes Therapy, by uh, Indian experts led by Dr. Mohan. Um, and uh, this consensus was actually, in my opinion, a replica of uh, a CGM consensus that was developed and updated in 2009 and 19. Um, so it pretty much uh, adopted from uh, those uh, guidance or, or the consensus in a, in a Western world. And they accepted the timing range is 70 to 180 as it is. So why uh, I think that the timing range of 70 to 180 is not appropriate. Um, so here are my reasons for that. Number one, that it's not a physiological range. Uh, we all do a lot of different tests, laboratory tests, um, so let's say, for example, if you do hemoglobin, um, TSH, um, alkaline phosphatase, serum creatinine, right? When you see those labs, what do you see? You will see a number, and in a parenthesis, it will give you a reference range. How do we define that reference range? So reference range is defined as that you, you do a, a population screening, those healthy people, and let's say, for example, let's think about the TSH level. Most labs are reporting as 0.4 to 4.4 uh, milliunits uh, per liter as a normal reference range. So what you're going to do, you're going to look at 100 people who are healthy, male, female, uh, those who do not have thyroid disorders. You're going to look at the TSH values in everybody. And then you form uh, a 95% confidence interval, meaning by that, what values are seen in 95% of those people? That becomes a reference range. Um, and so we do that all the time for all these different laboratories. Uh, why don't we do that for glucose? So what's the reference range for glucose? Um, this is just an example I showed you that reference range for alkaline phosphate is, this is my uh, old laboratory at the University of Colorado. Um, and you can see that there are different reference range for male and female, different reference range for uh, different age groups, right? Because uh, the values changes over time. And so uh, I think the reference range makes more simple concept, even for a glucose, rather than we call it a time in range. And that reference range can be different for male, can be different for female, can be different for premenopausal female than postmenopausal female, or for older adults compared to young adults. We need to do those kind of a things and come up with that reference range for a glucose. So for at least the US population, we did this study. Um, this was a study of trying to come up with the normative glucose data. We recruited people from a year five to 75 years of age, um, okay, I'm seeing something in a chat field. Um, okay, uh, it's hard for me to see, but if you guys see anything that I need to interrupt and answer, just let me know. Okay, otherwise I'm going to keep going. Um, so 
we did this study, uh, more than 150 individuals recruited across all these male, female, both sex, and across different age group. And what we saw is that um, 96% of those individuals, regardless of sex, regardless of the age group, um, spends between 70 to 140. Um, and if you ask me, honestly speaking, that the mean glucose is 99 milligram per deciliter with a standard deviation of about 9 milligram per deciliter. So if you do a two standard deviation to make it 95% confidence interval, that's plus or minus 20, right? So your glucose, uh, 95% of the time stays between that number of approximately 80 milligram per deciliter to 120 milligram per deciliter. But if you want to expand that slightly broader range to, to even have a more inclusive, then 70 to 140 um, sounds like uh, the reference range uh, for people without diabetes um, in the U.S., now, remember that part that it may be a slightly different for Indian population. I don't know. Um, I haven't seen any data, actually. And I asked Mithun and so many other people that if you can provide me data, I would love to really analyze that. Uh, I'm yet to see that data. Uh, because unless you don't know what's normal, how can you define abnormal? Um, and so I think, uh, in my opinion, you need to define that first to understand what's the normal glucose values and reference range for the Indian population. Now, the second argument that why 70 to 180 doesn't make sense to me uh, is because that, uh, how do we define prediabetes? We define prediabetes when it's more than 140 on a 2 or OGTT. That's what we call impaired glucose tolerances. That's where we call prediabetes. So if you really are defining prediabetes at threshold of 140, um, then why are we having a 180 threshold uh, for management of diabetes? I think it doesn't make sense. And we have a plenty of data to suggest that the impaired glucose tolerance test is an independent risk of a cardiovascular disease. And that means that glucose of more than 140 is not good. It is creating some kind of a damage, at least for a macrovascular complication. Um, and so if you are seeing people with prediabetes, if you are seeing people with type 2 diabetes on just the oral medication, 70 to 180 does not make any sense to me. Um, 70 to 140 makes uh, more sense in those individuals. Now, the third thing is that if you look at the threshold of 140, uh, it does have actually a clinical implication for a population health because um, you can define people who are going to progress from no diabetes to pre-diabetes if you select that 140 threshold. And there are studies around that and more studies are coming out. But I think uh, not going to talk more about that part because we are trying to stay about diabetes management rather than the population health and prediction tool here in my presentation. And also remember that in the first consensus that was done in 2012, the argument by a lot of experts was that uh, we don't have a good technology or a good therapeutics to achieve those 70 to 140. And so they wanted to keep it practical uh, as a 70 to 180. But things have changed now. You know, we have a terzepatide for management of type 2 diabetes, semaglutide for management of type 2 diabetes. I just posted like a one a recent article, Surpass 3 trial. And again, there is a QR code here. You can scan and read that article. Such a powerful study. Look at that, how many people are achieving. Now, these are people with type 2 diabetes. And this was a sub-study of looking at the CGM matrix on those people. Uh, look at, uh, I hope you see my cursor here. Um, so on my left side of the screen, this is a proportion of people achieving time in range. Um, in a terzepatide 10 milligram or 15 milligram, 90% of people are achieving that uh, 70 to 180. But if you look at the time in tight range, which is 70 to 140, look at that. It's almost like close to 75% to 80% people are achieving that part. So majority of the people actually are achieving that 70 to 140, which is a part of the 70 to 180, okay? Um, so I think we do have a potent molecules. We have a power, powerful molecules now to achieve those uh, more stringent glucose control of uh, 70 to 140 in type 2 diabetes. In type 1 diabetes, we have really good closed-loop systems now that hopefully will come up in uh, India in future. Um, um, those systems can achieve time in range of more than 70% easily. Um, so I think it's a time that we should probably uh, 
change our threshold of time in range from 170, sorry, 70 to 180 to 70 to 140. So my conclusion about time in range is that don't follow Western guideline. Um, I would suggest and I would challenge you guys that I think just generate the data, de generate the data from Indian population. You 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 can make your own guidance. Uh, why why you want to have uh, ADA or ESD or or ATTD tell you what to do? Um, so, and I think uh, I would encourage, uh, and, and it, I see that step that ACE is making because ACE just uh, published a guidance on type two diabetes management in Indian situation, which is really good and very different from uh, Western guidance. So ACE member, uh, all communities uh, uh, in the ACE, uh, please, um, you, you are using CGM in population, try to formulate the data try to make uh, all different Indian reference range. Uh, but uh, in my opinion, so far from the data from a Caucasian population, that is white population, I think 70 to 140 milligram per deciliter is, is appropriate time in range for most people with type 2 diabetes. And, and I strongly feel that that's also appropriate for most Indian patients with type 2 diabetes. But again, we need more data to really say that with the con you know, uh, conclusive uh, evidence. Now I'm going to switch a gear about MARD um, uh, because I think Mithun wanted me to speak more about the MARD. That what is this? Um, trust me, if you ask MARD to ten physicians, uh, I would doubt that anybody really knows what is this. But we are taking that as a face value, okay? Um, so I'm going to debunk some of the theories about MARD today. So here are two articles. There are QR codes that you can scan. There are plenty of articles, by the way, but I think these two are written well uh, that I feel like you, you would enjoy reading. So I have this QR code. You can scan that, look at those articles, and try to understand what are the uh, issues with the MARD. And I, I think Bob Vigreski just recently published this, you know, in DTT, and be, be very bold, and he said myths of MARD. So. Uh, which is true, actually, that the, we, we have a little understanding about MARD, and it has become more of a marketing tool recently. Okay, so let's understand, and I'm trying to uh, make this simple statistical concept for you. Uh, so I highlighted here uh, in a different color. It's a MARD is a mean, means average, absolute value, that's the A, of relative differences between sensor glucose and venous glucose, okay? Now, what that means? So what we do is a step one, two, and three. In a step number one, I'm go from a backward to, so, you know, RD, relative difference. So let's try to understand what is relative difference between sensor glucose and venous glucose. So for example, you are putting someone on a sensor and you are also drawing a blood from a venous uh, uh, or vein. <laughs> And then you are looking at the difference between the sensor glucose and the venous glucose at the same time point, okay? Now remember that the relative difference is a different than absolute difference. So let's assume that someone has a glucose of 90 milligram per deciliter, that's a sensor glucose. But then you draw venous blood at the same time and process it immediately and measure that glucose and the glucose is 80 milligram per deciliter, okay? So what's the difference? It's the 10 milligram per deciliter, that's the difference. So that is called as an absolute difference between two values. But what is the relative difference? Relative difference is 90 minus 80 divided by 80, okay? Um, it's a, 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 that becomes a, a relative difference compared to that venous glucose, and that's a 12.5. So remember that part that the relative difference is not exactly the same as an absolute difference. Okay, now why we call that as an absolute difference as well in MR because step number two, what we do is that we collect those differences, that is relative differences between two values across those different time range. So when we do these clinical studies, what we do, we just finished up one last week uh, with a new sensor. We invite these people in a lab. They come at seven o'clock in the morning, uh, sometimes even early. And they stay with us for 12 hours. And we do a venous glucose every 15 minutes. Can you believe that? Every 15 minutes. So four values approximately every hour for 12 hours. 
So that becomes about 46 values for that individual. That's a lot. And also we do more frequent sampling when the patients are in hyperglycemic range or hypoglycemic range. So we manipulate their glucose. So we give them more insulin, less insulin to make the blood sugar go up or high. So we try to go up to 400 milligram per deciliter and as low as about 50 milligram per deciliter. Very rarely we go less than 50, but that's uh, just by chance. And that's why all the sensors are reading about 40 to 400 milligram per deciliter because it's hard to manipulate more than 400 and less than 40. It's not ethical. Um, so when you don't manipulate the glucose, you don't have actually data. And when you don't have the data, you cannot put that in sensor. So that's why now remember that you have a 40 to one, 400 as a some kind of a threshold of measurement by sensors. Uh, that's true even for a glucose meter. Um, so glucose meter, when you do that, it says high or low. That means it's low means less than 40 and high means more than 400. Uh, but anyway, um, that's how we do. So every 15 minutes of those blood rows, we're going to calculate that relative difference. And then we make that relative differences across those 50 sample, 46 sample uh, as an absolute difference um, or, or an average of those relative difference. Okay. Um, so that becomes marred. Now, this is more technical uh, about the MARD. Uh, and it's actually a complex process than what I'm saying here. I'm trying to simplify this. Uh, so what are the issues with MARD? Number one, it's influenced by the external factor. So what we do in a clinical study is that we call it an arteriovenalization of blood. So what we do is that we apply a heating pad on the entire arm, the arm that we are going to do a venous blood draw. Now, when do arteriovenalization of blood, what's going to happen? Your arterial, remember, what happens with the heating? You have a faster circulation. When the circulation is fast, the difference between the venous artery and the capillary becomes a small. Okay? So, we are trying to make that venous blood as comparable as to the capillary blood and the sensor glucose blood. But in real life, we don't do that. Do you put the CGM and then apply that kind of a warming around that part? No. And so the MARD that is being calculated in a clinical study, it's more an artificial environment than the real environment, um, you know, where you are out in the field. And so uh, that's why the MARD doesn't make a sense in, uh, in, in a real situation. It's a slightly, as Mithun earlier said, that it's a slightly mani manipulated number. And also, it's an average. It's a mean, right? It's a first letter of MARD is M. M stands for mean. So it depends on a sample size. So if you have a large sample size, um, it would be much better for a MARD than a smaller sample size. So if you have a smaller sample size with some manipulation, you might be able to get the MARD to a lower number, but that's not a really good thing. Um, so... Uh, it is highly dependent on sample size, how many samples you have. The other thing is that the MAR doesn't provide information about the accuracy and precision. Um, so why I think this kind of a chart, you have seen that when you did medical school uh, or, or residency, we had, I don't know, it's the same thing, but the preventive medicine um, during my medical school. And in the preventive medicine, we used to have a statistics that we all ignored because uh, it's a, it's it's a, a difficult concept, and nobody was actually you know making us understand the statistics. So, but anyway, in short, you have seen this picture probably multiple time, and you may recall that now. Um, so, if I'm throwing a dart um, on this dartboard, um, if it's falling all over the place, that means that it's neither accurate nor precise. It, if it falls on just the one side of the corner, that means it's a very high precision but then the low accuracy because it's not in the center. It's like somewhere in a periphery. Uh, and if all the dart is like lie right at that dot in the central, that means uh, it's a high accuracy and high precision, okay? Um, so that's a, a concept in a statistics about the accuracy and precision. Now, MARD, MARD doesn't tell you that. And why? So here are two examples. Okay, this is an article that I just listed here that provides this uh, figure and some issues with the MARD as well. Um, so there are two sensors, a similar MARD, MARD of a 
you can see that first sensor on my left side here. Again, I'm hoping that you will see that cursor. The glucose numbers are probably more spreaded. Okay, same mod, by the way. It's glucose numbers are spreaded. That means that the sensor has some issue with the accuracy, uh, sorry, precision, but at least it's not biased. It's not biased towards one side. It is doing uh, everything all over the place. The second sensor, same mod, but you can say that it's biased towards the negative side. So it's a very precise, but the problem is that it's a precision is towards bias towards the one side. And we don't want that. And I will explain you uh, actually in a real life situation, what I mean by that precision issue, okay? Um, and the third thing is that neither the FDA or the ISO considers MARD for approval, okay? So here is the criteria by the FDA on my right side here that is required by all CGM companies to provide to the FDA for CGM approval. And tell me, there is no MARD here because they know that the MARD is not the right metric, okay? Now, uh, also the MARD doesn't provide the information on the accuracy during hyper or hypoglycemia or normal glycemia because it's a one number across all these different ranges. Actually, they can calculate that, but companies will not provide you those information because they don't want you to know all these details. So here is a real life example, okay? So this is a Libre system. This was a Libre one. Uh, when the, it was available in the United States. I don't know why my hand comes up, but anyway. Um, the Libre uh, first, now we have a Libre three generation. So this example is not applicable for US right now, but this is my old um, real life case that uh, I'm highlighting because I believe that you still have a Libre one in India. So probably this is applicable to you. You only have so Libre the one. Here. Yeah, so probably this is applicable to you then. Perfect, thank you, Mithun, for confirming that. So the MARD is, says that 9.4. Now, it might say something different in India. I don't know because the marketing in India versus U.S. may be slightly different. And then uh, I'm comparing the Dexcom here, Dexcom G6, which has a MARD of 9.0. 9.4, 9.0 is not different. Okay, it's a 0.4. So if you think about MARD, these sensors are highly comparable. Okay, highly comparable. But then... I'm going to show you this part. So this is what they submit to the FDA because the FDA is not going to care about MARD at all. The FDA cares about the concurrence. What is concurrence? Concurrence means that what is the value of a sensor at the time your venous glucose is X, Y, or Z, okay? So what you see here on the top uh, uh, panel is the uh, venous glucose uh, through the YSI. YSI is a yellow spring instrument. This is a standard gold standard for venous glucose measurement. And on the column here um, that you will see that the sensor glucose value. And my left side is a Dexcom G6 system. Okay, and now I highlighted something in a round here. So let's look up at the glucose value of a 40 to 60 milligram per deciliter. So when your venous glucose is a 40 to 60 milligram per deciliter, remember that's a venous glucose, that's a real glucose value, 67% of the time, the Dexcom will say it's a 40 to 60 milligram per deciliter. So it's a 70% accurate during that low glucose range. This is a freestyle Libre 14-day system, Libre 1 system. Look at that 40 to 60 milligram glucose value. It's at 24.7% of the time, it's going to say 40 to 60 milligram per deciliter. Okay? Remember that part. But 41% of the time, look up a little bit. 41% of the time, it's going to say less than 40 milligram per deciliter. So what it means? It's a bias towards hypoglycemia. It is telling you lower than what actually you are. Now, let's look up at another one. That's a 60 to 80 milligram per deciliter venous glucose. 33% of the time, which is 34% precisely, if you want to round that up, it's going to say you are at 60 to, one, sorry, 60 to 80 milligram per deciliter. But almost 50% of the time, it's going to say you are lower than 60 to 80 milligram per deciliter. So this sensor is biased towards the lower side. And this is a real example. This is my patient actually in a study. Um, she used the Dexcom and Libre 1 system on a same arm, on a same day, okay? Everything is the same in this ex because it's a study, research. Look at the time spent in less than 70. It's a 
Look at the time spent in hypoglycemia with the liver, 19%. Okay, so almost double the time of hypoglycemia on a Libre 1 system. Why? Because I showed you here, it's bias towards the negative values, towards the low glucose values. But the MARD is the same. So MARD does not provide you any information about the accuracies or precision or the bias of the sensors during those different glucose ranges. And MARD is, has no value for a clinical outcome. So these are two sensors. One is the Metronic sensor on my left side here, uh, which is Guardian for Connect system. I don't know which one is available in India, Mithun. It's a three or N light. It's Connect, Guardian Connect. Yeah, but Guardian Connect, which version? Three, four, or? When, when I say Connect, it's first version. Okay, so this is a four. So your first may have a slightly higher MARD. I don't know, actually. I, I'm sorry, but you know, I don't know the information. So I don't want to misquote that. But here is the Guardian 4, which is the latest sensor. The MARD in adult is about 11%. Okay, this is the Dexcom G6, which has an MARD of 9%. So you might say that Dexcom is much, much better than actually Medtronic. But if you look at the Medtronic 780G outcome data and a tandem control IQ outcome data, they are very similar, very similar, okay? The timing range achieved in a Medtronic 780G in 100,000 people is about 72%. And in a tandem control IQ, uh, timing range, uh, you know, across like even though if you look at about one year, it's about 74%. Okay, very similar outcome. So MARD has nothing to do with the performance of closed loop system. Now, remember that part, it's for closed loop system, not for people uh, without those kind of uh, uh, system. But overall, I think you are not going to make any decision based on MARD. You are gonna make the decision based on absolute glucose and the rate of change of glucose value. That's more meaningful to our patients rather than anything else. So in my conclusion about the MARD, MARD equal to marketing tool. Um, I would ignore that number. I really don't care about that. It, it does matter, okay? But it's more of a research side and some other things, uh, but not really clinically. And it doesn't provide any clinical meaningful information to either you or your patients. And it's not even considered by regulatory. It's completely ignored that number uh, by any regulators. Um, so I hope... Uh, it may help you to understand the uh, limitations of time in range and MARD. Um, that's the end of my presentation and happy to have any questions if you have. I think excellent talk. Excellent talk. Very yeah. I, yeah. I, really I like learn it. more yeah. about MARD in a very, very lucid manner. Yeah. I do. I do agree with you. Um, uh, Viral. Um, it's when it comes to reporting hypos, um, because we've been using Crystal Libre, we haven't got access to Dexcom or anything. I did use Dexcom though before coming uh, back to India in England, which was fantastic. But when it comes to freestyle libre, I see too much of hypoglycemia. I mean, the patient is feeling absolutely fine. Yeah, so just ignore those because you are using the one. So they fixed that in a Libre 2 and 3. So in USA now, it's not the problem anymore. Um, so remember that part, it's because that the algorithm needs more data. And they didn't have the enough data in less than 70 range. So when they are trying to make that kind of an, um, a regression line, it was biased towards the hypoglycemia, which has been fixed now. Uh, but if for you guys, because you are using still Libre 1, this issue still is applicable to you. And I would ignore a lot of hypos that you are seeing because they are not real hypos. They are just the sensor drifts. What do, what do you say, you know, we have presently, what we have in India is that we have Libre 1, we have Libre Pro. So the company isn't very much interested in Libre Pro because the cost is, is quite less. And we have a new CGMS, uh, which is coming and more data needs to be done on that. Between Libre 1 and Libre Pro, is there any head to head or something? Because, you know, with Libre 1 using for type 2 diabetes patient T2DM, there is not uh, much evidence in T2DM in, in Libre, in, with Libre 1 
versus Libre Pro, as I'm aware of. But I could be missing the plot here if you, if you have any studies or if you have any experience. Yeah. I, I don't know, Mithun, again, I think it's hard for me to really know exactly what version that they are selling in India because it, it depends on what software version they are using. So let's say, for example, if they are doing Libre 1, but they are using the software version, which is the same of Libre 3, let's say, for example, I'm making this up, then it's not the problem. Uh, no, no. So, but but to my knowledge, it's not the case. But so pro version versus the one version, I, I don't know. So it's hard for me to tell you the difference between that two. But what you can do is that you can ask them um, about the uh, concurrent stable that I showed you. So here in the United States, it's by law that they have to provide you the user guide, which is approved by the FDA with all the data that FDA has seen and approved. Um, but nobody reads uh, anyway here either. But uh, the guidance is a part of the manufacturing. So when the patients open that box, there is a small booklet. It's a hard to understand by patient, by the way, because it's a lot of technical language. Uh, but if that's something available in India, you can look at the concurrence table. And then I showed you how to look at the, the bias. And so if that's the case, then probably your pro and one are either same or or different. I, yeah. I think the Libre yeah, but guys are going to have a lot of questions in the next two days, the same questions from a lot of people. Uh, it will be very interesting. Actually, it will be very interesting. To see I would ask them the data because yeah. they should provide you this concurrence table. Uh, that's more meaningful than Mart. I think I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, factory calibration is a question from Hema. She sent me factory mm -hmm. calibration versus manual calibration. Uh, you know, previously in Medtronic CGMS when they'd come we used to do wing finger glucose for calibrating. Now they say if they are factory calibrated, is I mean, I presume factory calibrated is also an algorithm that is there. So, yeah. So. Uh, so this is a good question, and I think I don't know how much technical detail uh, I, you want to hear from me, but in the past, um, when they do a manufacturing, what happens is that the batch-to-batch -batch variation in a sensor, uh, sensor glucose measurement, if it's exceed above the allowable standards, that means the performance of one sensor compared to another sensor is not going to be the same. In that case, it requires an external calibration. And that's why the old generation sensors wanted that external calibration to make sure that the sensor is performing okay. It's more of like telling the sensor that, hey, you are doing okay job, okay? Uh, and that factor is actually considered into the algorithm. So let's say, for example, uh, if your sensor says 300 and you do a finger stick glucose and it's a 150, and if you enter that 150 number, what it does is that 150 plus 300 divided by 2, and it will immediately change that sensor value to a mid-range uh, of that 150 to 300. But that's an older version, by the way. Uh, now, the manufacturing precision has improved so much um, that one sensor from one lot um, and another 10 sensor from the same lots will have a glucose measurements in very precise manner. Okay, so it's e easy for them to impute, which again, an external factor, but we call it a factory calibration. Okay, so let's say, for example, whatever the variation between those sensors, it's a small variation, but then they will calculate that kind of a things and they will come up with a number and say this number is over some kind of an uh, uh, external validation that will become a factory calibration number. And so that will be included in a barcode. Uh, if you scan that barcode, it will pick up that external uh, factory calibration and will be used in a similar manner that you are using as an uh, uh, your external calibration that we used to do with the uh, older version. So anyway, it's, it's a more of a manufacturing process thing. Um, and factory calibrations are as good as, I think in US, hardly people really pokes their finger um, because the, all sensors are factory calibrated. So I had a question, uh, you know, um, going back to Libre, in a type one diabetic in a child, uh, and I have had this pro problem. Um, so like you said, they they report a lot of hypos when actually the patient is not having hypos. So how would you convince the parents, you know, to ignore that hypo that is showing on their Libre, 
but actually is not a hypo because my uh, patient's parents sit up all night and the next day they send me this huge <laughs> whole you know uh, data where they show that this is hypo but actually finger prick doesn't show any hypo but they're not ready to leave the child because it's a child only six year old so they are worried um, so what would you do in such a scenario yeah, no it's it's a tough question and i i don't have a practical solution because there are people who are more anxious and I think, you know, uh, Mithun, I gave a talk at uh, the Kochi one that I think it's our job not to make people more anxious. Uh, because if you tell them that the hypo is going to kill you and then hypo is less than 70, they will be more worried about that part. And trust me that not that many hypos uh, kills people, okay? And the statistics are not that solid. Um, so I, I think education is number one. But that's a problem here too. It's not different than uh, what you are talking. I think our patients are same thing that they would read in Google, say that consensus says less than 70 is in hypo. And then they would uh, say, oh, no, I don't wanna spend more than 1% of my time. Um, but uh, you try your best in educating, giving some kind of a data and say that I'm, I'm least concerned about this part. So you can look up this part, uh, level one versus level two. And if it's a seven, it's between 60 to 70, those I would ignore in Libre 1. If it's less than 54, I would not ignore because less than 54 is going to be less than 70 in reality. So those are going to be so-called uh, more of a hypoglycemias. Um, and, and so if that's the trend that you are seeing, then it makes sense. But if that's not the trend, then I think reassuring people and having that kind of a faith over time trust, right? I think once they develop a trust with you, then uh, you can probably change their belief. But before that, it's hard. It's hard. Yeah, just a, a little uh, question for you, Vera. Um, So this TIRs, so I always had this question, but I think you might be the right, right person that I could ask uh, regarding this TIR, 70% between 70 to 180. Say somebody has 70% of their day running at, say, 179, just say. And then they say, uh, uh, you know, less than 25%, um, uh, they, they, they can have above 180 and 250 or whatever. So then if you look at this, the average glucose would be somewhere around 190 or, or even higher. So it doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree. And that's my point, that if someone stays, let's say, make up this as an example, stays at 170 milligram per deciliter 100% of the time, that's 100% time in range. Yeah, that 170 is okay. No, it's not. It's horrible. So um, these are the issues. Um, and uh, so if you tighten up time in ranges of 70 to 140, then you will see that issue less often. And that's more appropriate. And and I believe that we don't have solid outcome studies yet uh, based on these 70% TIRs and stuff, do we? So... That's a good question, and I think it's a, it's a, a separate talk. I think uh, the reason is that mm. the correlation between time in range, time in tight range, and A and C. So, okay, between the CGM matrix is about 0.8 to 0.9. It's pretty mm. closely related. Mm. And so, if you say that that can you separate time in tight range versus time in range for outcome? It's impossible to separate. Okay. Um, it's it just the one piece uh, kind of a things that uh, you cannot cut them into two. And the correlation between time in range with A1C and time in tight range with A1C is about 0.75 to 0.8. Hmm. So 20% to 25% variation in a complications are not explained by glucose, which we know that there are some people that uh, have a complication despite have a good glucose. And there are people who are running around with A1C of 10%, and nothing happens to them. So those are 25%, because if you think about uh, the correlation of 0.7 to 7.5, that means it's a 70% is explained by glucose, not everything. Uh, and so I this question, I don't think that there will be a good answer to that. Unless that someone does dedicated study like a DCCT, which uh, there is a lot again on this topic. Uh, there is one question that has come up, and I think the lady has messaged me again to ask you this question. There is some thought when we said that, you know, the sensor of Libre works for 12 days or to ignore the first day and ignore the last day. 
or ignore the first few hours is okay. I think it takes time to adapt. Um, any idea about ignore two days first and last, or does it really your experience and your views on that? I, I think that's a that's another good question. And every single sensor, whether it's a Libre or whether it's a Dexcom, whether it's an Eversense, struggle with the first day. It's because of the inflammation around that sensor site uh, and the amount of the bleed. Um, it's a variable in people, and that throws the sensor accuracy um, slightly outside what we would like. So it's a problem with every single sensor. I'm not going to ignore that, but I would just say that anytime that doesn't make sense, then just do a finger stick and check it and, and make sure you're fine. Um, trend value are still helpful, mm -hmm. even though they are inaccurate, but it's at least provide you some kind of a trend value. So let's say after a meal, if you're going up, you're going up, whether it's going up from 140 to 150 or 150 to 170, but you're going up. So trend values have some uh, you know importance in uh, helping patients to to do some behavioral modification change in their dose or something. Um, but yeah, day one is always an issue. And that's the same thing about the tail end. So it, by by between 10 to 14 days, it's not going to be the accurate either. Um, so all the sensors uh, struggle with the same thing. It's because that by the time you will have a more fibrosis development, right? So uh, then sensor will start developing uh, some kind of a small uh, uh, the fibrotic tissue around that that it doesn't get enough interstitial glucose to to do that measurement. So there are a lot of physiological uh, variation inside the skin that are hypothesized to to make it difficult for sensor accuracy. Like for example, Eversense is an implantable CGM in the US which lasts for 180 days. So what they have is that they have like a small cap on the top of the sensor which is a dexamethasone. So it released a slowly over a period of six months in a, such a small, minute quantity that it cannot be measured in a blood, but it remains in a local tissue to reduce that inflammation. Um, and that approach is being applied to a lot of different sensors too. Uh, but yeah, these are difficult uh, physiological things that are hard to, to manipulate, you know. I, I, think, I think one food for thought, and I'm sure we'll, Murli and Sandan and all of us will agree, We'll try to get some data. We will we'll we'll get it sponsored on the race and we'll try to get some let this meeting have an outcome and an end result. Yeah, you need to have your own estimated A1C, you need to have your own logistic regression, you need to uh, all the CGM metrics. Uh, I think you need to develop that for Indian population. My gut feeling is that the time in range and time in tight range may not be that much of difference, and as well as the mean glucose, but the GMI and other factors would be much different uh, because. Uh, the relationship between the A1C and the mean glucose is not the same as Caucasian in Indian population because of a lot of other factors. So your estimated A1C would be slightly different. Any more questions? Um, so I think there's a question. Uh, Chandan, do you want to take that question? I think Hema is there. Hema, why don't you ask your own question? Why don't you put your video on and ask your own question? I can't see any new questions. Okay. I'm in a very noisy environment, so I'm, I'm typing. Okay. So he might see patients and making money as well while we are. Uh, <laughs> that is the reason, real reason that is there. Um, so I think I think the fact is that using sensors for lifestyle modification, it does help. I think it, it I'm sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I think, again, uh, we don't have enough evidence right now, but that's something that can be generated. Um, it, it makes sense, but then... Uh, not that every sense is uh, can be confirmed or, or uh, anyway, I think in evidence-based medicine, you would need something to say that, yes, it, this sense is actually evidence-based. Thank you so much. Uh, we've got Smita with us. Uh, Nisha is about to join as our newest member. Nisha, can you put your video on? Smita is there. Yeah. Hi, Smita. Um, Smita, do you want to ask something? Uh, no, I was, I, I, I'm just curious. Uh, so. Uh, Viral, all your patients have their sugars less than 140? The answer is no. Um, uh, absolutely no. Uh, but uh, let's say, for example, how many people have an A1C of less than 7% across the world? We know that it's less than one third of people. But we, are we changing our A1C goal? No. Uh, so science has its own place versus what's the reality. Um, and the reality is that no. Uh, but 
if we don't set up the goal, we're not going to try it. And so 70 to 140 is something that you set up a goal. Um, and once you have a goal, somebody will try it. So if mm. you think about half glass full and half glass empty, I would say that at least uh, there are people who are achieving less than seven because we are setting up a goal of less than seven. Sure. Fair enough. And, and uh, just another suggestion uh, with regards to uh, non-diabetics or pre-diabetics, a lot of these people are... Uh, I think uh, taking on CGM is just through fitness apps and everything. So I don't know. We, somehow we have to tap the data for non-diabetics also. Uh, if you can, uh, that would be good data because uh, the evidence in that space is almost close to zero. I, I think, thank you so much. It has been a wonderful discussion as always. I've learned a few things. Um, I really like the way you actually made that slide on mart very lucid i think you know the first slide you know it was very nicely explained i'm sure a lot of viewers will understand that a lot of pharma people will gonna have all the cgms guys who are there will have tough times whenever they come to our clinic we'll ask everybody's going to ask for data now um on that note thank you so much viral you've always always been there you've never refused i've got viral to he's actually given a talk for me at 5 a.m and i felt very guilty about it um, <laughs> But he has always been there. He has done that as a friend. And I think that's the sign of a good friendship. Um, and now I try to be more civil and give him and ask him for better times. But <laughs> he I think it's it's a fabulous, fabulous presentation. Yeah, yeah. fabulous. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate I that a lot. And we will come back on something. We'll do something this year. Um, I asked Chandan to give the vote of thanks and we'll conclude the session. Yeah. So um, I think it's been a wonderful evening and I'd like to extend my heartfelt thanks to Dr. Shah uh, for his insightful talk. I think it was very clear. Uh, it made a lot of things clear for me as well. Um, and you've shared your expertise on time and range and MARD. Uh, and your insights, I think, have been truly um, enriched uh, our understanding. And I think this will undoubtedly help in managing our patients better. Um, and I'd also want to acknowledge our uh, online organizing team, you know, the RX people, so Ankit and his team, and our very dear president, Mr. Dr. Bithun Bharatiya, uh, without whose, um, I think, hard work and uh, support, this event would not have been possible. Uh, a big thank you to all those who participated as well tonight. Um, and I would look forward to seeing you and welcoming you for our future sessions as well. So have a good night, everyone. Thank you and good night.